Hello and welcome to the Creative Brain and Aging, part of Creative Brain Week here in Trinity College Dublin, the real campus and the digital campus. Um, the session is about networks, plasticity, empathy, legacy. It builds on uh, a conversation that we've been having all day about neuroscience and creativity that is part of the conversation that we're having all week. And uh, when we were putting this together, we, we were delighted that we could reach out to Dr. Bruce Miller, who's uh, director of the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. And uh, Bruce, Professor Miller, I wonder whether you might be there. Um, hi. Hi. Great to see you, Damon. Great to see you. Hello. How are you? Hello. So oh, great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I keep forgetting there's a delay. Um, so I think the best way of doing this is um, that I mean, maybe just if you give the presentation and then we can build some questions around it. Um, Great. I think that's probably, i just hand over to you, will I? Wonderful. Thank you for organizing this uh, most important event. Um, and let me share my screen. Um, Great. Um, so I'm going to give you a very personal story about uh, my research and studies in, into creativity in the brain. And uh, they come um, not out of uh, theory, but out of personal experience with people becoming artists in the setting of progressive language disorders. But I confess, I have. Uh, a huge passion for the arts, um, was originally an English major. And um, just I want to comment briefly that um, what Dominic has done with this conference is so fundamentally important, uh, I think, to both art and science. Uh, one of my favorite writers, uh, Doris Lessing, Nobel laureate, wrote, what uh, society doesn't realize is that in the past, ordinary people respected learning they respected books and they don't know, they don't now, or not very much. That whole respect for serious literature and learning has disappeared. Uh, I think all of us wanna change that. Um, here is uh, Mae Jameson, a physician dancer uh, who went out into space and she points out the difference between science and the arts is not that they are different sides of the same coin or even different parts of the same continuum, but rather uh, they are manifestations of the same thing. The arts and the sciences are avatars of human creativity. And one of the things I've realized is that a number of artists uh, from the past um, actually uh, were way advanced over the scientists uh, in the spaces of uh, neurodegeneration, consciousness, aging. Um, our own uh, San Francisco uh, National Poet Laureate, Kay Ryan, says that Emily Dickinson was the first neuroscientist, and I'll uh, show you an example of that in just a minute. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, again, I will uh, talk a little bit about this story, actually described a progressive language disorder associated with visual creativity uh, before this had ever been described by scientists in the literature. Doris Lessing, I, I think, exemplifies this. Uh, she uh, saw ahead of time uh, what climate change would do to our planet, uh, wrote extensively about uh, uh, apocalypse related to this. One of my favorite novels that she wrote, Shakasta, talked about the wisdom of long-lived creatures. Gertrude Stein um, showed uh, language structure uh, that was captured before Noam Chomsky did in the field of linguistics. And then finally, anyone who has read Virginia Woolf uh, knows that she uh, captures consciousness, uh, uh, how this interweaves with the self in a way that no scientist had ever captured it uh, before. So we, we must listen to our, uh, our artists uh, formally. Um, and, and listen to them for clues about uh, who we are and how our brains are organized. 
So this is Emily Dickinson. Um, she was writing about moral decay. Uh, and uh, I would say remarkably, I think this captures in very modern terms the neurodegenerative process. She writes, crumbling is not an instant act, a fundamental pause. Dilapidations, uh, processes are organized decays. This is the organized decay that I'll describe of neurodegeneration. There's first a cobweb on the soul. In modern terms, we would call this a misfolded protein, a cuticle of dust, a borer in the axis, a borer in neural circuits, an elemental rust, ruin uh, uh, or the neurodegeneration, or in this case, moral decay, is devil's work, consecutive and, and slow, fail in an instant, no man dead, slipping or this degenerative process as crashes law. So I, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, visual creativity uh, today and uh, uh, a little bit about language, um, but just emphasize that this is something that is truly uniquely human. Um, around 15,000 years ago, whether it was uh, caves in Colombia, uh, caves of South Africa, uh, cave paintings in Spain and, and France, uh, such as this one in Lascaux, began to uh, occur on the a planet around 15, 20,000, some a little earlier, 40,000 years before the Christian era. And um, this uh, represented, a, I think, a fundamental change in the human brain, um, a, a change that uh, forced some people to express art in a completely new way. Not all of us, but some of us. Um, so um, uh, Picasso loved this prehistoric art uh, and wrote, I think, somewhat uh, tongue in cheek, but uh, also I think respectfully toward the amazing humans that produced this early art. After Lascaux, all art is decadence. I'm going to summarize in this one slide, uh, you know, my sketch of what happens with art in the brain. Um, I think clearly, without a doubt, the right posterior brain is dominant uh, for copying, uh, imagining scenes. Uh, in the case of the Lascaux artists, imagining an animal and then copying that internal image. Uh, onto a cave. This is one of the things that uh, artists do. Um, the posterior, uh, the left side uh, uh, is uh, much uh, different in the artistic process. It's symbolic, linguistic. I think some of the conceptual aspects of language, the ideas behind the visual production uh, come from the left uh, hemisphere. And um, when you injure the left uh, part of the brain, uh, particularly anteriorly, uh, you don't change very much this ability to copy or imagine. Um, there's also, I think, a not only a dichotomy between left and right, but also anterior, posterior. Posterior brain is involved with capturing visual images, perceiving them. Uh, and uh, anterior part of the brain is uh, very strongly involved with interpreting those images, but also in the case of art, uh, planning the motor activities that are needed to create that uh, visual image. So that, that's a very simplified view of this. And I'm, I'm going to uh, show you a little story about Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia. Um, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, this uh, visual uh, part of the brain, uh, angular gyrus, uh, uh, the um, uh, posterior parietal and temporal lobes are really critically, particularly on the right side, important uh, for creating onto a canvas or a cave a visual image. The anterior part of the brain is much more involved with planning, organizing, uh, probably some of the conceptual aspects of this, particularly the left side of the brain. But remarkably, we have two degenerative diseases uh, that uh, hit these entirely different neural circuits, these uh, systems in the brain. So in the case of Alzheimer's disease, uh, you see the area of atrophy. 
that is right in those uh, visual imagination uh, copying regions of the brain. In the case of uh, frontotemporal dementia, the uh, anterior systems involved with uh, semantic knowledge representing ideas and concepts, words, uh, is uh, attacked uh, in the frontotemporal dementias. So I'm, I'm going to describe a little bit about what we've seen first in the cases of Alzheimer's disease, but then with frontotemporal dementia in terms of what happens to art. So I, this is, a, I think, a very prototypical uh, picture of uh, Alzheimer's disease art. It's uh, one of my patients. Uh, uh, she uh, had been a, a, a visual artist, a much more complex imagery structure. Um, uh, but as the disease uh, progressed, she lost that ability uh, to copy with that precision. Um, I think her ability to imagine colors uh, and uh, some simple structures, these uh, plants, uh, is still preserved. So this is uh, uh, the sort of art that she began to pr produce in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. Not just typical of her, but I think typical of the art of many people with Alzheimer's. Here's a later picture which she gave to me. Um, and uh, it sits in my office, I love it. Um, but I think it, it shows in some ways the preservation of color, but the disintegration of structure and form. Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, her simple purple blue uh, painting. Um, very, very nice to look at. Um, de Kooning, and this has been written about in Lancet by Espinel, uh, developed Alzheimer's disease. And uh, his work uh, went uh, very much like my patient, uh, uh, Megan, uh, from very highly structured, uh, abstract, but conceptual pieces uh, uh, to much simpler use of just line and color. Um, uh, I think, again, that is the intersection of Alzheimer's disease on the art of this uh, uh, great painter. Some people like uh, de Kooning's later work uh, even more than his earlier work. Um, I'm an early fan, but uh, uh, I think uh, this is uh, an example how a great artist's art is changed by the Alzheimer process. Uh, I got to work with uh, Willem Untermullen's um, incredible uh, wife, uh, who was an art historian. And uh, she uh, was able to tell me the story of uh, his deterioration with Alzheimer's disease. Um, maybe not deterioration. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide. But uh, Untermullen, like uh, I think more than a few artists, uh, had left hemisphere dysfunction as a, a young man. He was dyslexic, didn't read very well. Uh, he made these uh, beautiful self-portraits in 1967 while in art school in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, this uh, picture he did in 1996 is the intersection and Untermullen's realization that he was developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so uh, he made half of this picture worried about his memory and his language. Um, and half of it after he had been diagnosed at uh, Queen Square by the, the great neurologist Martin Rosser. And uh, I think in this self-portrait, you see the worry, concern, sort of peering into an uncertain future uh, through this window of uh, Untermullen. He was a very courageous man, um, very depressed with Alzheimer's. Many people are not, but he was. And he made this series of pictures uh, of his own face, his self-portraits. He peered right into the disease. Uh, and, and I think we'll never know exactly what he thought about these pictures, but you can see uh, him watching uh, the slow disintegration of his perception of a face and his ability to draw it. Um, and, and this is the Alzheimer process. His, his last, uh, I think, rather whimsical, beautiful, but very sad picture 
shows a fracture of this uh, tiny face of Wundermullen. Um, I think in, in many ways still capturing the spirit of this great artist. So in, in the 1990s, I, I uh, serendipitously began to realize that creativity in what we then called frontotemporal dementia was not rare. Um, uh, the story was, and I, I think uh, many people belittled the story because we didn't have a conceptual framework for it, but the story was patients with frontotemporal dementia can develop new artistic skills after disease onset. First described this in Lancet in uh, 1996, but my bigger paper came in 1998. Uh, uh, the, the idea at that point was visual creativity was more common when the anterior temporal lobes or left frontal lobe show focal degeneration. In this uh, paper, we described the emergence of musical visual creativity uh, in 12 patients, all of them had FTD. Uh, we argued that art in the association with FTD was not a coincidence, and also at that point realized that the more left-sided neurodegenerative forms of FTD, the semantic uh, variant, which hits the anterior temporal lobe on the left, and the non-fluent aphasia uh, were the ones where we saw this bl uh, blossoming of visual creativity. So this is Maria Lugorno Tempini's work. Uh, she uh, delineated three different subtypes of uh, primary progressive aphasia. Uh, one, uh, the anterior temporal lobe is hit, the semantic variant, which I'll talk about next. Uh, the second was uh, the non-fluent uh, progressive aphasia, uh, which hits the left inferior frontal region. And there was a more posterior form of progressive aphasia associated with Alzheimer's disease. I actually think Untermullen had this uh, form, uh, so his language was a little spared. Uh, I have a hit badly, and, and his visual spatial skills were relatively spared during the course of his illness. Here's the semantic variant. I'll show you a brief clip. And notice uh, this uh, lovely woman loses not only the word for many items, but also even the concept of what this uh, item does or stands for. Is that it's the, uh, a fruit? fruit? It's an apple, fruit. Dog. Calls a rabbit a dog. <laughs> Doesn't know what a sled is. Can? Knows that's a can. Cat? Thinks a frog is a cat. So she is losing her semantic knowledge about the world. I'm going to go on. This is a subtype of frontotemporal dementia. The first manifestation is usually loss of words. Uh, you also very quickly lose the meaning of words or the knowledge about what those items are. And since you don't know what the item is, your uh, naming is not improved by giving clues, uh, which is uh, much more common with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, here's the anatomy of semantic variant progressive aphasia, originally called semantic dementia. Anterior temporal lobe degeneration, intense. Um, also, uh, orbital frontal cortex, there's some disinhibition. Um, also involves the insula. It's a more left-sided disease. So it's very much initially associated with naming uh, and language difficulties. So uh, uh, I was on my way to Columbia reading 100 Years of Solitude and came across a, a, a little piece around the time we were writing about the semantic variant progressive aphasia uh, in this book that made me realize that Marquez had described semantic variant before it had ever been described. This book was written in 1967. First uh, descriptions were in the 1970s of this in science. So here's uh, uh, what happens in this tiny uh, town of Macondo. Um, uh, people get a sleeping sickness, uh, and then um, he describes what happens. He discovered he had trouble remembering every object in the laboratory. He marked them with their respective names so that all he had to do was read the inscription in order to identify them. This is a cow. 
she must be milked every morning so that she will produce milk and the milk must be boiled in order to be mixed with coffee. Uh, so this is what this person who is losing their knowledge about cows and milk and coffee does to preserve the memory. They went on living in a reality that was slipping away momentarily captured by words, but which would escape irremediably when they forgot the values of the written letters. Um, and I think this is Marquez, uh, whether he ever saw a semantic variant case or not, I don't know, but uh, this is him describing a world without language. So we wrote about this, and um, this is one of my patients with semantic variant. And this is also not unusual with semantic uh, variant progressive aphasia. People just become methodically obsessed uh, with keeping order in their world. And so this is a diary, scotch tape, trying to remember what scotch tape is, regular implant, uh, shrimp cocktail, all, all of these words, uh, 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 also uh, uh, addresses, uh, he's trying to keep uh, memory of where he lives in California. Um, so much, I think, like Marquez's description of what happens uh, to his per, uh, uh, person in Macondo who is losing language. So uh, with semantic variant, because you lose your knowledge about what a cow is, uh, you slowly, uh, you know, uh, start to uh, generalize uh, in terms of what an animal is. But because the posterior parietal region, the part of the brain that we visualize things with and copy them, uh, is relatively preserved. So here is my patient Bob's uh, drawing of the cow. Um, we uh, evoke the, the, the book of Ga Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Here's his elephant. Uh, quite precise uh, uh, visual reproduction. Here are concepts of uh, animals. A dog looks a little bit like a, a donkey. Uh, maybe it has features of a cow. A cat, again, is much more prototypical. Fish uh, looks like a turtle, uh, maybe a bird, uh, maybe an insect. A and, and this is the degeneration of semantic uh, concepts. Uh, if you have semantic variant, you don't know what a frog is. Uh, you're asked to color it in. You pick uh, any number of colors, but uh, not the right one in this case, which should have been green. This is a, a art piece from one of uh, my patients, never an uh, engineer, never had done any artistic work, but he started welding in the setting of semantic variant progressive aphasia. And this is uh, a, a prototypic animal, uh, has features of an insect, a bird, uh, has six legs. Um, so I, I think uh, it's a very beautiful piece, um, but I think it captures the kind of semantic loss uh, as the visual skills are spared and the sort of art that often comes out with semantic variant progressive aphasia. When the right side of the anterior temporal lobe is hit more than the left, you lose your social knowledge, your social network, your ability to describe a face, your abil ability to recognize a face. And uh, this is a, st a study done by Howie Rosen that showed that the uh, more severe loss of the volume in the right amygdala, the more severe deficits were in the ability to recognize negative emotions. So, you lose that ability to describe a face and know what that face is feeling. Um, this is a patient of mine who became obsessed with painting on boxes. Uh, he had utterly destroyed uh, relationships with people, uh, but was fascinated by couples. And uh, uh, here he uh, captures a, a couple. I think he's trying to capture the closeness, but because he doesn't understand uh, ordinary human emotion. Uh, the faces are rather bizarre, and uh, this couple is very unconnected. Uh, his uh, ability to conceptualize a, a human diminished. Uh, his uh, drawings became more, uh, you know, constructed around pieces of the face, bicycles, and uh, some of the last pieces that he did uh, only used. Um, simple 
um, lines. I, I call this occipital art, art that uh, really is just unconceptual, uh, but purely visual. Um, re reconstructing what the brain is still able to reconstruct. This is Ann Adams, and this is the last case I'll go through before we discuss. Uh, Ann developed progressive non-fluent aphasia. This is 1992. It's Ann um, drawing, uh, describing a painting, the kite painting, and uh, here we go. And I'd like you to take a look at this picture and take your time. And please tell me what you see. And if you can, please try to speak in sentences. Okay? Take your time. I know this is a little bit difficult. Tree. Um, people. Dog. Man. So non fluent, very few words, no grammar, nouns. Her comprehension at this point is very good but her ability uh, to describe this picture with grammar, uh, with verbs is uh, completely uh, destroyed. So Anne's a uh, very interesting story, PhD in biology. Uh, she was interested in columnar epithelium. Uh, they decided to take a, a trip to Egypt around 1993. Around that time, her son got sick. She decided to leave work and she started painting. This is uh, really the only painting that uh, Anne did uh, that ever showed a face. This is her and her husband, Robert. Um, uh, but I think it's the beginning of an amazing artistic journey. This is Anne's masterpiece uh, called Unraveling Ravel. Um, and what it does is uh, Anne became obsessed with Bolero. Each color represents her favorite note in a meter of bolero. She captures uh, increasingly the rhythmic repetition, uh, but also the crescendo of bolero. Uh, suddenly there is a change in key. Uh, this is captured in these gaudy fluorescent pinks. She uses these black uh, squares and triangles and circles to capture tonal changes that she heard. Uh, so this is Anne's visual representation of Ravel's remarkable bolero. This is uh, from her diary at the time. Uh, you can see here she's going methodically through the piece, uh, choosing a, a color for a note, uh, and uh, eventually settles on a specific color scheme um, to capture in a visual way uh, this remarkable piece of music. Uh, here's Anne with good language uh, at this point around 1994. Uh, the colored treble parts are embellished with geometric shapes in black, also engraved into the paper to represent the quality of tone of each note. When the modulation finally does occur, I use gaudy fluorescent colors to make the few changes in the piece. Uh, the music soon collapses and dies in the final two bars. I find Bolero an exciting experiment in sound one which Ravel didn't really consider true music. Um, serendipitously, but also through a lot of incredible work, Bill Seeley was able to get a, uh, an image uh, of Anne's brain that was done because she was complaining of hearing issues. Um, and this was around 1994, slightly before uh, the production of Ravel uh, began. Um, and you can see here, that Anne's brain, shown in blue, in the left uh, language area, the left frontal region, is statistically smaller than 30 age match controls. By contrast, uh, when she is obsessed with Ravel, 
obsessed with colors, obsessed with painting, this right posterior parietal region is statistically bigger than 30 age match controls. Similarly, blood flow uh, shows uh, that exact story. So what, what we see here is um, uh, something uh, I think rather magnificent that uh, uh, as Anne slowly losing this left uh, frontal region involved with the production of speech and language, a uh, part of the brain that we use to uh, read music, this right posterior part of the brain, is getting selectively larger. Um, also, uh, part of the brain that is involved with uh, tuning to symmetry, uh, this is a healthy subjects viewing symmetry, uh, right posterior parietal region uh, is actually again, getting statistically bigger. Uh, so obsession with symmetry. Uh, let me show you some of her pictures. So this is, a, 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 this is Unraveling Ravel, a pun. This is a slightly simpler piece. It's called Pi. and chooses a, a color for each number uh, and shows this random uh, change in numbers as a pi. Uh, you know, translates out uh, into infinity. This is a gouache. It shows you her technical skill, not an artist initially, an artist because of the degenerative process. You see these beautiful rocks, um, I think captured even more beautifully than a photograph could ever have done. This is Anne's symmetrical alphabet, uh, obsession with symmetry. You can see these uh, octopuses. She made this for her grandchildren. These are worms. These are arbutus leaves from Vancouver, again, capturing a decay. Uh, this is 2002, around the time you saw Anne speaking, um, but this remarkable vibrance in the decay and symmetry of these leaves. This is uh, one of La Anne's last pi pictures. It's uh, Belgium, Ghent, and uh, captures almost perfectly replication after she returned from Belgium, what that city looked like. So uh, this is Anne's story. Thanks for Bill Seeley uh, for uh, putting this together. She had a creative peak around 53. That's when she produced Unraveling Ravel. Uh, this is at age 57. She made pie. Uh, then she began to develop uh, language symptoms, still produces this book of invertebrates. Uh, Arbutus leaves were done uh, at age 63, Amsterdam, Ghent, uh, 64. She progressively loses right hand function, stops painting, and dies of progressive non-fluent aphasia. Remarkably, Ravel died of the same disease, and Bolero was produced about six years before the formal presentation of his disorder of language. These two people captured uh, by their obsession for uh, something that connected them and I think in an extraordinary way also tells us something I think extraordinary about the brain. Um, Jake Broder, uh, uh, who will be a new GBHI fellow uh, and Nikki Taylor, uh, a GBHI fellow uh, Jake are going to be producing a story about Anne. Uh, Jake has written a brilliant uh, play about Anne. It, it uh, won uh, uh, the best scientific play of the year, New York Times. Remarkable, erudite, emotional, often genuinely funny, easily one of the best, most thought-provoking plays of the year. New play by Jake Broder with support as a, initially an artist at UCSF and now GBHI. It's already reached uh, 1,500 people in the first month. Uh, it has people talking about dementia and frontotemporal dementia. And there will be a new production of this coming to Leeds Playhouse, uh, led by Nikki Taylor, and also a parallel one at the Wallace Annenberg Center in uh, Los Angeles, and even more to come. 
Uh, so Anne has inspired, uh, I think, even greater heights in the arts, uh, thinking about uh, the brain, science, and humanity. Uh, I uh, mentioned just a few of the amazing artists that have come through Global Brain Health Institute. Alex Kornhuber, aging in Peru through photography. Dana Walworth, you've seen Alzheimer's, Alice Alzheimer's, beautiful, powerful work. Josh Kornbluth has uh, shown uh, his uh, really subtle touch of comedy, uh, making videos about the values that we should have in science. Magda Kazmerska has shown in a brilliant way, dance and dance with aging and how to teach aging people uh, how to dance and protect their brain. Nikki Th Taylor is working in open theater. Dominic uh, Campbell, you see his magnificent with this festival. And finally, I had the opportunity to uh, work with Cindy Weinstein on a book about her father's Alzheimer's disease, and I described the science of it. Conclusion, art uses both hemispheres. I think we really do have a double consciousness. Uh, art may emerge in association with left hemisphere dysfunction. Uh, it leads to rewiring of posterior brain. It certainly gives insights into the degenerative process. Uh, also into the arts and insights into our humanity. Last comment. So this is the, the book, uh, Finding the Right Words, that Cindy and I wrote together. I just want to make a comment how I learned about memory in a different way writing this book. So I, my mother I, I, uh, was a brilliant artist, a uh, huge influence on me. And this, uh, she loved animals, and she lived almost 95. This is her paint. Um, this is, uh, excuse me, her painting, uh, The Life and Death of Billy Miller, a, a beautiful Australian Merle Shepherd. Um, this is the birth of Billy. And these are the memories my mom had of walking in the park with Billy and, and with my father. Uh, and uh, uh, you see these little squares uh, of experience um, summarized in the memory as, uh, you know, I think simple uh, pictures that, our, our attempt with our memory system to capture the remarkable memories that we have all created in a, in, in a common event that happens every day. Um, then you see uh, Billy beginning to die and uh, my mother is very mystical. You see his, uh, you know, moving off into uh, space after, after the death. Um, so we have this concept of memory. We have episodic memory, which is, we experience it, what happened, where, and when. And then we have a uh, so-called uh, semantic memory. And these are memories that we have that are facts, like uh, the pictures, the dogs, the cats that were uh, devastated with semantic uh, dementia. And I, you know, and, and, I, and I realized that the way my mother captured her memories is really the way that we uh, capture old memories. We don't capture them by re-experiencing the event. We capture them as little frames uh, that summarize the experience of, of, of what we've had. I recently had a remarkable opportunity to speak with someone uh, during which I had what is called a flashbulb memory. I was in college. We were driving to see Janis Joplin. Uh, I was about 18. Uh, my girlfriend was sitting on my lap. Uh, we hit a deer. Uh, we started to careen toward a, a cliff. Uh, my, uh, my girlfriend, who had an incredible aplomb, said uh, goodbye, Bruce, and, you know, offered an aphorism of love. I am thinking wildly about how we get out of the car. Anyways, the car stopped. And I realized even a flashbulb, that flashbulb memory, as I talked to my friend about it for the first time in 50 years, um, is not a is not a flashbulb memory. It's exactly like my mother's painting, a series of pictures, uh, little summaries, little semantic summaries of the key pieces of that experience that we want to keep. So I'm I'm going to study this. We 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 have a number of people who have described flashbulb memories in our research, and and I want to try to capture what that really looks like because I think it looks very differently than we ever uh, would have imagined from our theories. Thank you.
So Bruce, thank you. I'm going to open it up to the room in a second. And while we're doing the mechanics here for that, um, there's, there's always an awful lot when I listen to you. Um, I, but there's also patterns that we can make and, and conversations that we started today that we can pick up on. Uh, there was Rory Cusack and other people talked about um, imagining the world that we move into so that we can conceptually imagine the, the reality that we step into. And it strikes me that in some ways, the, something you, you touch on quite often and something you do yourself actually is about the urge to create. It's, we, we, you talked a lot with, with Ultimol and other about, about paintings as, as data, I suppose, the data that tracks the progression of a, of a disease. But I wonder whether you might talk a little bit about the urge to create. Yeah, I think we're all different. Um, one of the things that uh, one of our GBHR fellows, Adit Friedberg, is working on is looking at semantic art uh, artists, people who had semantic uh, variant progressive aphasia, who created versus those who didn't. And uh, thinking about what is the difference between them. And I think the more I know about artists, the, the, the more I know that uh, whatever they learn, there is also this unbelievable passion to do something in the art uh, that they eventually decide to create in. And uh, it's not obsessive compulsive disorder, but it is a, a compulsion, a need to do something. Many cases it is done over and over again like the frontotemporal artists that I've uh, seen um, repeated again and again until the art reaches a, a certain perfection. And you know why that happens in some people and not others, I think is a great mystery. So I, I think you know we all have certain artistic capability, me less than many others. But with that said, uh, I think there are some people who combine this obsession with really extraordinary skills. And uh, I, I think that's one of the things that Adit is trying to understand. What is the anatomic basis of that? And, and even, I think more important, can we stimulate that anatomy uh, in people who may not have that um, uh, particular pa uh, talent? Yeah. As somebody who supports artists and who recognize that you write beautifully and write often and well and also play music, pretty well and enjoy it. Um, I think uh, you're as much an artist as anybody else. I wonder if there's a question in the room that we might kind of pick up on. Hi, Bruce. Thanks very much for a beautiful, beautiful talk. Your, Thank your, you, your paper, um, where the original paper that I wrote, where you showed this flourishing of musical or artistic talent in patients who um, had developed uh, dementia. My question for you is this, um, how, we se how central is the language system, if you like, the degradation of the language system to the un disinhibiting, if you like, of other processes of presumably being inhibited? Um, and I ask this in the context of evidence, for example, um, people who are not wine connoisseurs if they're asked to do a memory test for different kinds of wines and you ask them to, to uh, either talk about the wines that they've just tasted versus just try and remember them sensorily and, and gustatory processing, and, and these are not experts in wine, the ones who talk through their experiences of the wines end up with zero ability in memory to discriminate the different wines. And there's also evidence of um, creative thinking, uh, uh, th things like inside problems that where you cannot solve them with convergent analytic, verbal analytic thinking. Where, yeah. So my question for you, two, two questions. One is, are there other, is, is it really all about language or are there other processes whose degradation releases uh, capacities, if you like. And secondly, how, how it, I'm guessing it's possible for us to, in fact, there is some evidence that we can actually loosen up that inhibition without anything as drastic as uh, frontotemporal dementia. 
Yeah, brilliant, brilliant uh, comments and questions. And uh, now I know I can't remember wines, Ian. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, language uh, uh, reliant. That I, I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to take up that new, uh, you know, approach. So I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, like in this particular story, you know, I think with the, there are many different stories. I'm sure around the arts and the brain and. What is, uh, what is relaxed and what is enhanced. But I do think uh, it is uh, tightly associated with the loss of uh, some kind of language. This number one, the, the visual obsession, and number two, I think the, uh, the uh, visual abilities. One of the things we've learned in, in Adit's paper, this is gonna come out, that something really important happens in the brain with the repetitive practice of these artists. So they, they are remarkable in that they're an opportunity to study the emergence of art over a very quick period of time when language is degenerating, but the brain is under active change. Um, and, you know, I, I think you, you know, I could spend my entire life uh, thinking about this. And, uh, but I think it's a story of strengths and weaknesses. Howard Gardner's great book uh, in the 1970s, I think, um, he talked about different geniuses and talked about asymmetric they were, how Martha Graham was kinetic, uh, how Picasso was visual but couldn't, was not a good reader and couldn't do math. So, uh, you know, I think these asymmetries may really enhance some of the great outliers in the arts, uh, whatever, whatever modality they use. Well, we've brought ourselves to time and uh, we've also brought ourselves to the end of an extraordinarily enriched day. Um, we can carry on online. We're delighted that we'd be able to do all of that and that we now have a, an archive of all the day's presentations. Um, I'd like to thank the people in the room, but I'd also like to thank Bruce Miller hugely for joining us. Um, thank you, Bruce. Thank you.